In the year 1909, New York City stood as a captivating blend of tradition and progress. Streets bustled with horse-drawn carriages and early automobiles, while pedestrians dressed in Edwardian fashion navigated cobblestone roads. Against this historical canvas, Artil introduces its first character. Though history neglected to remember her name, we know she was a farmer, a chicken farmer. We also know that she was far past her glory days. The only picture that remains of her shows her painful and arthritic hands wrapped around a hen, the chicken that started it all. This hen was the reason the farmer had undertaken the tiring journey from Long Island to the Rockefeller Institute in New York City. The prized hen, of the barred Plymouth Rock breed, was possibly the best bird in her flock, or a personal favorite. Recently, the farmer had noticed on her body a swelling deformation that got bigger by the day, and it filled her with worry. She had grabbed her coat, grabbed her chicken, and headed to the Rockefeller Institute, where she hoped the finest pathologist in the country might save her chicken just yet. The hen was brought to pathologist Peyton Rouse, a young medical researcher who had only recently started working at the Institute. Rouse was intrigued by the tumor and decided to investigate. In this hen there was present, projecting sharply from the right breast, a large, irregularly globular mass. Operation was done under ether and nearly all of the growth removed. Bits of it were at once inoculated into the other breast and peritoneal cavity of the host. Thirty-five days later, the chicken that started it all was dead from tumors in the peritoneal cavity. And two other chickens that had been inoculated with tumor material now also showed tumor growth. And so, the plot thickened, or in this case, chickened. Rouse put his whole focus on experimenting with this newly found tumor and soon started publishing research papers about his work. In 1910, he concluded that this is the first transmissible tumor found in birds, and that repeated bacteriological examinations have come back negative. The implication here is clear, though Rouse wasn't quite bold enough to spell it out in his paper. The tumor must be caused by a virus. What did he say? Viruses were only discovered in the late 1890s, and all that was really known about them was that they were 1. Too small to see with a microscope. 2. Too small to get caught in a fine pore filter. And 3. Somehow causing disease. So if you were a researcher, and you had not seen any parasites or bacteria under the microscope, had done the bacteriological testing that came back negative, and demonstrated that the disease-causing material could slip through fine filters, while bacteria couldn't, then you could pretty much conclude that the disease was caused by a virus. Cancer was yet another mystery altogether. It rarely popped up, and when it did, it usually played a deadly game of hide-and-seek with scientists, making it tough to study because it often took the host's life before they could unravel its secrets. Cancer was also endlessly confusing, because there was simultaneous evidence that it was caused by harsh chemicals, by no apparent reason at all, and now by viruses. The virus-causing cancer conclusion didn't make much sense compared to what was known at the time. Viruses were known for their cell-killing behavior, that's how they replicated and spread. Now to suggest that a virus was doing the opposite, forcing their host cell to thrive so much that it would grow uncontrollably, really seemed like a paradox. But some other research teams were finding supporting evidence with other tumor types and a breakthrough seemed to be on the horizon. It came in the form of cancer researcher Johannes Fibiger, who received a Nobel Prize for showing that rat stomach cancer was caused by a worm called Spiroptera in 1913. His work was strong proof for the idea, first indicated by Rouse, that cancer was another infectious disease. That was, until Fibiger's Nobel Prize was declared one of the biggest blunders, after it came to light that his conclusions were not holding up. This only became clear after he passed away in 1926, so at least he was saved from the painful experience of watching his lifelong diligent research fall apart. It was a huge embarrassment to the small community of cancer researchers, however, and they threw the proverbial baby out with the bathwater, discrediting Fibiger's work and the notion that cancer could ever be caused by an infectious agent. Rouse's cancer research was ridiculed and then put away on the shelf of research that we would rather not talk about, where it would collect dust for 40 years. He saved some samples of his virus, called Rouse sarcoma virus, RSV, and spent the next 20 years pioneering research on blood transfusions and the liver, as you do. 
As Raus went on to opening the first ever blood bank in Belgium, figuring out the function of the gallbladder and discovering the causes of gallstones, the rest of the scientific field slowly moved forward one discovery at a time. The birth of cell culturing techniques in the 1950s and 60s opened up a whole new realm of research possibilities and sets the stage for the next chapter in our story. <coughs> Harry Rubin graduated as veterinarian from Cornell University in 1947. He was interested in virology research and in 1955 found himself messing around with the chicken cell culture and Rouse sarcoma virus, perhaps with a specific goal in mind, or perhaps, as it often goes in science, just for the sake of it. Today, there are many different cell lines you can simply order online to do research on, but back in the 50s, researchers had just about figured out that if you harvested cells, put them in a petri dish, and give them a bit of nutrition daily, they might stay alive for a few weeks. Rubin armed himself with a culture of chicken cells, infected it with RSV, and waited for the hasty death that would follow. Except it didn't. Where most viruses would enter cells, multiply, kill the cells, and infect new cells, it seemed like RSV was doing the opposite. The infected cells were staying alive far longer than any healthy uninfected cell had ever lived in a petri dish. Not only that, they started displaying traits typical for cancer cells, a rounded morphology and altered metabolism. This must have been a real eureka moment for Rubin and his colleague Howard Tiemann. They suddenly grasped that they had achieved something groundbreaking. The very first instance of cancer occurring outside a living organism. This represented a monumental shift in our ability to understand cancer. Prior to this breakthrough, scientists were essentially left scratching their heads, peering at tumor samples under microscopes and grappling with the mystery of why and how these transformations occurred. Patients would sadly succumb to the disease without any clear answers. However, this discovery opened the door to studying the intricate mechanisms of cancerous changes in a controlled laboratory setting, right under the microscope. It was nothing short of revolutionary. In addition, Rubin and Tiemann uncovered that the cancerous cells that just kept on dividing all came from one cell initially infected and changed by RSV. This finding was a major game changer in cancer research. Perhaps every cell within a naturally occurring tumor in a person's body also comes from a single starting cell that went through some changes and then kicked off a process of making copies of itself. Over time, these copied cells multiplied into the millions or even billions forming the tumor. And so, our modern understanding of cancer was born. <coughs> Peyton Rouse finally received recognition for his exceptional work on Rouse sarcoma virus by being awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1966, more than 50 years after his initial discovery of the virus. And that chicken farmer, whose name we don't know, who brought a deer hen to an inquisitive pathologist in 1909, has no idea about the magnitude of events she set into motion. Her bit of wisdom to us might be, keep your chickens close and your tumorous chickens closer. This is Nick the Veterinary Guy. Thank you for watching today's video. And of course, make sure to like and subscribe if you want to see more stuff like this.